الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان السلام عليكم my friends welcome to another episode of the revelation experience my name is Miraj Muhyiddin and today we're going to be continuing our uh, dive into Quran year four. In the previous uh, episode, we talked about uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, going public with a message, specifically with that brawl that ensued between some of the Muslims who were praying, who uh, got into a brawl with the Meccans. Then we talked about a section talking about how a lot of the Meccan surahs were an invitation to reflect. Today we're talking about 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5 in the Revelation book. First is the early surahs and a warning against arrogance. So what we're seeing here is the Meccans were becoming more and more financially wealthy. They were becoming more and more arrogant with their tone and the way they were um, carrying themselves, specifically with those who had less than them. And so a lot of the surahs start addressing this attitude, this arrogance that is prevalent amongst the Quraysh. One of the things that they would say to the Prophet, peace upon him, is that if God really wanted to send a messenger to the Quraysh, God would have sent an angel. Why is he sending just some regular old man, putting down Muhammad? Though Even though the, he was the most respected man before he became a prophet, he was known throughout the city as Al-Amin. When he came with a message that is unpopular, they started putting him down. Oh, you? Just you? Why, where's the angel? God would have sent us an angel if he really cared about this message. So, what does Surah Al-Furqan say about this? It says, Those who think that they're never going to meet us say, So why aren't any angels being sent down to us? Right? Angels are malaika. Why aren't we seeing our Lord face to face? They think so high of themselves and their audacity is enormous. When the day comes that they finally do see the angels, the sinners won't have any good news at all that day. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ لِقَاءَنَا لَوْلَا لَوْلَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْنَا الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَوْ نَرَى رَبَّنَا لَقَدْ اسْتَكْبَرُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ وَعَتَوْا تُوًا كَبِيرًا يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَا بُشْرَى يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُجْرِمِينَ So here Allah is talking about the malaika, the angels. They're asking to see the angels. Allah is saying, you're going to see the angels on another day. And when you see them, you're not going to be happy that you're seeing them now. Because they're going to be coming with some very heavy news for you. So here we're seeing this group of people who are called kafirun, right? We heard that surah before, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ This word kafir, which is often used and thrown around a lot in modern parlance. Oh, he's a kafir, he's a kafir. Muslims do it all the time, and, you know, uh, people from other faith traditions like to kind of use that also as a derogatory term. What does kafir mean? Well, kafir comes from kufr, which is this idea of, you know, one person, one author, Karen Armstrong, actually did a very good job trying to explain this very succinctly. And so she said that a kafir implies a discourteous refusal of something that is offered with great kindness or generosity. Okay. What that means is like if you gave someone a gift and they just took it and swiped it off and laughed at you and kind of just like spit in your face, that's what kufr is. You're giving a gift very generously to someone and you just throw it back in your face. It's this really disgusting refusal, violent refusal of a generous offer. And the Quran does not berate the kafir for their lack of religious conviction. The main attribute of the kafir is arrogance. It's that sense of like, I don't need this. Like, get this out of my face. Like, just get away from me. Like, you guys with your, ugh. Stupid, I don't need this. That's the attitude of kufr. That they see the truth, but they throw it back in people's face. Okay, And that is what we're hearing here in this um, definition of kufr. The kafirun are bursting with self-importance. They strut around haughtily, addressing each other in an offensive, braying manner. And they fly into a violent rage if they think that their honor has been impugned. They are so convinced that their way of life is better than anyone else's that they are particularly incensed by any criticism of their traditional lifestyle. Wow. 
So that's Karen Armstrong defining gaffer there. But like that is a word that you can use in so many different circumstances, that behavior, that attitude. And unfortunately, it's very easy to look at other communities and say, oh, that's like a very, they're very arrogant. And they just think their way of life is better and so forth. But you see that behavior even within the Muslim community, which is very troubling also, where there's a lack of open mindedness and people are quick to berate anyone else who might bring an idea to the table. So anyway, the kafirun of Mecca who are being so discourteous and just kind of slapping the Prophet peace upon him in the face, even though he's coming with this kind and generous offer, the Prophet gets instructions from Surah Al-Isra about how to respond to this threat that, oh, God should have sent angels if he wanted to talk to us. And the Surah says, Say to them, speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, say to them, if the earth were populated by angels going about their business quietly, then we surely would have sent an angel down from the sky to be a messenger for them. Then say, God is enough of a witness between you and me, for he's well informed and watchful over his servants. قل لو كان في الأرض ملائكة يمشون مطمئنين لنزلنا لنزلنا عليهم من السماء ملك الرسول قل كفى بالله شهيدا بيني وبينكم إنه كان بعباده خبيرا بصيرا so I hope you're hearing in this section, and the reason why I'm spending some time on this is you, I really want you to get a sense of the level of arrogance that surrounded the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was dealing with some incredibly arrogant people. And what we know from the story of Adam, peace be upon him, in my understanding from my teachers, is that the first sin and the cardinal sin is the sin of arrogance. We see that because in, in the creation of Adam, Peace be upon him. Allah tells the angels to bow down. Everyone bows down except for one jinn, and that is Iblis. He disobeys God. And the reason why he disobeys God is, he says, why should I bow down to him? He's made of dirt, dust, mud. I'm made of fire. That is the cardinal sin, is the sin of arrogance, this sin that I am better than you, I have this genetic code, you don't have this, and so forth. All this racism, greediness, everything that we see, in many ways you can trace back to this one simple cardinal sin of arrogance. And that is the worst of all sins. And so Allah is giving the Prophet, peace be upon him, coaching on how to deal with this kind of, the Arabic word for it is istighna, which is like a haughty, self-absorbed, overconfident self-reliance. From the beginning, the Qur'an cautioned the Quraysh against their istighna, this arrogance. And it is reminding them about the judgment day, how humiliating and humbling it will be. Surah Al-Qariyah, very powerful surah in the Qur'an, the sudden disaster it is called. It says, the day of judgment it's the day when people will seem like moths fluttering about, when the mountains will be like tangled tufts of wool. In other surahs, like Surah Al-Muzammil, which we had heard earlier, right? Allah tells the Prophet to confront the arrogance of the Quraysh head on by saying, how then shall you shield yourselves if you disbelieve in a day that will turn children's hair gray? I mean, like, that's like a horror story, right? It's such a stressful day, the day where you have to face your Lord, the day that you have to pay back your debt, Yom Din, right? The day of paying back your debt and you don't have the money to pay back your debt to the Creator, the one who created you, that's a day that will turn children gray. So there's some very heavy 
language also in the Quran. And I want and I want you to understand why there is heavy, dark language in the Quran. And again, remember when I told you in the very beginning of this entire series, I struggled reading the Quran. Part of it was because it's like I'm reading this really heavy stuff. And why is God trying to scare me? Well, you have to put in the context of who Allah is talking to. He's talking not just to me. He's talking to the Quraysh who are being nasty to the Prophet, who are you know, throwing things back in their face and declining to believe in any of the miracles that he's showing them. And that's exactly what we see in the commentary of the Quran is Allah is describing what's happening on the ground. It's like we have a historical first-hand evidence from the Quran describing what happens. For example, Surah Al-Isra, which we mentioned earlier, it says, and so it is that we've explained the issues in various ways in the Quran so that they can be reminded, but it only seems to make them distance themselves even more from it. And this is where the sweetness of the Qur'an starts coming together. This is why we spent a lot of time talking about the prophets before. Because what we're seeing in this Meccan period now is the stories of the prophets who came before. And just think for a second of the kind of strength it gave the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him and the companions to hear this verse from Surah Al-Nuh. It says... And there's some supportive auxiliary text in this, just so you get the full context of it. He, meaning Noah, was ignored, however, and in his despair he cried out to God, saying, My Lord, I've called to my people through the night and through the day, but my invitation only seems to make them drift further away. Every time I've called to them so you could forgive them, they've stuck their fingers in their ears and wrapped themselves up in their cloaks growing more stubborn and more arrogant. And so here we have Surah Al-Nuh named after the Prophet Noah. And this Surah is describing the distressing way in which Noah's people rejected his message. I mean, Noah's complaining to God. They're sticking their fingers in their ears. They're getting more arrogant. They're not softening from your message. They're actually turning against me more. And the surah's timing in the early Meccan period, it must have been such a source of comfort and a source of guidance to the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, that if they are not listening to you, if they are not following you, don't worry, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry, because you are walking the path of the prophets. You are walking the path of those who had the exact same experience that you did when they brought the message. Remember, this is what Waraqah had warned the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. He said, I wish I could be alive the day that your people will throw you out. And this is exactly, Quraqa knew this. He knew the stories of Noah, I would have to imagine, and the stories of, of all these prophets who came before because he was a Christian Hanif. And Quraqa was on point with this because that's exactly what we're seeing here in this early Meccan period. So what happens is as the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, is dealing with all of this increasing resistance, the Quraysh decide to begin this smear campaign against the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. Let's just totally destroy his reputation so that people won't believe him and people will stay away from him. That's the plan now. And you can see these are just growing signs of desperation. And because one of the issues you have to understand, you know, this is, it's very simplistic to say, oh, the Quraysh did not want to believe in one God because they were just ardent pagans. It wasn't really, in my read at least, it wasn't just seriously a philosophical debate. I honestly don't think they cared that much about that, as most people don't care that much about this stuff. Usually, fierce opposition comes when political and economic um, risk is at hand, right? When people who are in power see the possibility of a disruption that's going to take them out of power or that's going to take money out of their hands, that's when people get nasty and people 
start going to extremes. And my read on the Sira is that that's what you're seeing in a lot of people's reactions because it's mostly the wealthy people, the wealthy tribal chieftains who are the nastiest to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who have the most to lose by a paradigm shift in Mecca. So we're seeing this happen more and more. And a classic example of this is an interaction between the chief of the clan of Makhzum, who was like the wealthiest clan and the most powerful clan in Mecca, and a clan that was on the opposite side of that Quraysh rift. Remember, the Quraysh had rifted between the scented ones and the Confederates. Well, the Makhzum are like the head of the Confederates. And so their leader is a man by the name of Walid ibn al Mughira. Walid. He is actually the father of Khalid ibn Walid. That's where Khalid ibn Walid gets his name, right? Khalid, uh, Walid ibn al mughira he hears some of the Prophet, peace be upon him, verses, and he is kind of touched by, wow, there is something to these verses. There's a sweetness to them. There's something really special about these. Now, when one of his fellow clansmen, Abu Jahl, another Makhzumi, hears that Walid is touched by these verses, what? Are you telling me that the Qur'an is getting to you? No, 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 no. This is not the plan. Are you telling me that Muhammad is speaking the truth? What do you think is going on here? And what we understand from the story is Walid is like, mm, I don't know. It, it sounded really good. And then Abu Jahl is saying, you need to publicly declare that this guy is a crazy man, that he's a madman. You need to start this smear campaign. I can't be losing you to someone who's actually admiring the words that he's reciting in the Qur'an. And so Walid is like, yeah, I know. I mean, obviously I don't believe in him. I mean, he's crazy, but it did sound pretty good. But no, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't bring myself to do that. There's too much to lose. But he was, ah. And then finally, Abu Jahl gets him by saying, oh, maybe you're just trying to accommodate the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, because he owes you some money or his friend Abu Bakr owes you some money, etc., etc. He's just trying to get him, right, at his weak spot, his pride, his arrogance. And that's what does it for Walid. And he publicly declares that the Prophet is this crazy magician, a poet. How do I know this in such detail? Well, Surah Al-Mudathir documents this entire sequence. And we've talked about this, for those of you who listened in order of the uh, Revelation Experience uh, series, we've covered Surah Al-Mudathir, and I kind of just covered it very briefly right here. But we know that Allah says in the Surah, talking about Walid, He pondered and He schemed against me. Oh, so now he is doomed. Oh, how he schemed. Once again, he's doomed. Oh, how he schemed. Then he looked around and saw the truth of God's signs. But then he frowned and scowled, turning arrogantly away, saying, This Quran is no more than some remnant of the magic of ancient days. This is no more than the speech of a mortal man. so again, you can see the internal turmoil. This is kufr. This is the idea of the Prophet is giving you something generous and beautiful. And even Walid, his initial response is, wow, this is amazing. But he covered it. He saw the truth and then kufr. Cover. He covered the truth very discourteously and he called the Prophet, peace be upon him, he called him a crazy man. And this language that the Quraysh used against the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is very prevalent during this time. We see this in many surahs, Surah Al Hijr, Surah Al Sa'd, Surah Al Qalam, which is the second surah to be revealed. What do they say about what they said about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Let's take a listen. The Meccans say, Hey, you, the one who's getting this quote revealed message, we think you're crazy. So why aren't you bringing down angels to show us if you're really so honest? 
Bring down the malaika if you're truly honest. وَقَالُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِي نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ إِنَّكَ لَمَجْنُونَ لَوْ مَا تَأْتِيْنَا بِالْمَلَائِكَةِ إِن كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ Surah Al-Sa'ad says, So are they surprised that a warner should come to them from their own people? Yet the faithless only say, He's just a lying magician, a wizard. He has lumped all the gods together into just one god. That is a strange thing indeed. I mean, what a ridiculous rebuttal of the Prophet. They're basically saying he's taken all the idols that they believe in and he just stuck them all together just to create this one God named Allah. Right? I mean, that's kind of like their tone. Then you see in Surah Al-Qalam, right, the second surah to be revealed. Indeed, the faithless nearly unsettle you with their venomous stares. When they hear this reminder and they shout out, He's crazy, majnoon. However, this is no less than a reminder to all the worlds. I'm going to read to you several other passages and then we'll end this episode here because I think it's really important to understand what was going on in this early Meccan period so you can understand why the Quran has such strong language against these people who are nasty to the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him. The next passage is from Surah At-Tatfif. The wicked used to laugh at those who believed. They winked at each other whenever they passed by, then hurried back to their associates to laugh and joke. And whenever they saw them, they would say, Truly, these are the ones who got it all wrong. What a powerful verse. Allah is describing these Quraysh. And again, yes, it's describing the Quraysh. But these are archetypes of people also. These are personalities that exist in our day and age just like they existed back then. These are people who wink at each other whenever they pass by Muslims. And they hurry back to their associates and they're laughing and they're joking about how backwards other people are. And when they saw them, they say, these people are the ones who got it all wrong. And Allah is saying, no, 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 no. You will see on another day who truly got it wrong. Again, Surah Al-Furqan says, the faithless say this is all just a pack of lies that he's made up and some people helped him do it. They're the ones who brought an unfair charge and an unsubstantiated accusation. They say, it's all just tales from long ago that he's ordered to be written down. They're being dictated to him in the morning and the night. Another common smear campaign that they mention is that the Prophet peace be upon him is crazy and possessed and that the jinn, right, these are non-human creatures involved in magic and whatnot, who are inspiring Muhammad with these demonic verses, these crazy kind of hallucinated verses that he's coming up with and spitting out. That's what they're saying about him. We know that from this verse from Surah Al-Furqan. Yet another attack on the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, some said, oh, he's being inspired by a jinn. Others said, oh, there is a man in the city, a foreigner, 
who knows the biblical stories, right? He's a foreigner, meaning he's a non-Arab who now is residing in Mecca. And there was a nasty rumor going around saying the Prophet Muhammad would visit this man and get his stories of the Hebrew times and the biblical times, and then he would change it and now tell these stories. And the inspire, the person writing these verses is actually this man, this foreigner. Well, Surah Al-Nahl takes that accusation and turns it back against the Quraysh and it says, we know what they're saying. It's a man who's teaching them. But the tongue of the foreign slave to whom they're pointing at is not even fluent in Arabic, while this Quran is in the purest and most precise Arabic. So here you see Allah defending the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, with their own logic. I mean, fighting back right away. Another verse, this one from Surah Al-Furqan again. It says, now they're saying, what kind of a messenger is this? He eats food just like we do and he walks around the markets. Why hasn't an angel been sent down to him to warn us alongside him? Why hasn't he been given a treasure or a nice garden? like the ones he talks about in the afterlife, in which to have his meals. So this is what they're saying. Why isn't he been given a garden like he's talking about in the afterlife? Then these same corrupt critics say to the believers, you're following some kind of lunatic. Now Allah talking to the Prophet says, do you see how they're making you out to be? However, they're the ones who are mistaken and they'll never be able to find a path to salvation. Now responding to their threat, how come this messenger doesn't have a garden that he talks about in the heavens? Allah responds and says, blessed is he who if he willed, he could have made for you something better than that, gardens beneath which rivers flow and could make for you palaces. Wow, so some really heavy firepower verses here that I just laid on you. And it's really important that I think you hear these. It's important for me to hear these too, because even rereading these again, it just ignites in me just this, this sense of protection. I want to protect the Prophet Muhammad. I wish I was there to protect him from this onslaught that he was getting, the nastiness, just the utter. These aren't mean people. These are nasty people. They were arrogant. They were reckless. They were rude. And they challenged him every step of the way with one stupid argument after another. Who the hell is this guy? Send an angel. Why the hell are you talking to me? Get out of here. I mean, this is the kind of language. It's probably more obscene language than I'm using right now. I'm just trying to heighten your sense of how nasty they were. Um, so anyway, I hope, I know I, I gave you a lot of Quran in this uh, session. I actually like it. Honestly, the more I can listen to Hassan speak and the less I speak, the happier I am with every episode. So I hope you enjoyed that. In the next section, we're going to talk about an incident that uh, brought on a very specific surah in the Quran called Surah Al-Abasa. Very important surah. We'll talk about that in the next episode. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. I can't wait to see you guys in the next episode. Please visit all those surahs that I mentioned if you get a chance. We will be going through all of them at the end of this section regardless. I will see you guys soon. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.
الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون أولئك أصحاب الجنة خالدين فيها خالدين فيها جزاء بما كانوا يعملون